During the Second World War, the Allies spent an astounding three and a half trillion in adjusted 2023 dollars on munitions. And while the goal was to throw those at the enemy, those munitions had to be manufactured, and stored, and transported, creating risk to everyone along the way. A risk that became all too real for the people of rural Staffordshire in the United Kingdom on November 27th, 1944. Gypsum, or calcium sulfate dihydrate, is a common and useful mineral used to make plasters of all kinds, as well as sidewalk and blackboard chalk, but also carvable alabaster and used as a fertilizer. Gypsum has been used in construction since ancient times. Formed by deposits from lakes or seawater, gypsum is found in many parts of the world, and today some 150 million metric tons are mined annually. The Wolds Historical Association notes that gypsum is widely distributed in England and that commercially significant gypsum deposits mostly occur in a band from Somerset to North Yorkshire, as well as the Carlisle Basin and the Cheshire Basin. The website mindat.org notes that gypsum has been worked in the vicinity of Fald near Tutbury in East Staffordshire since at least Norman times. In a local history of Tutbury by Helen Lee explains that for hundreds of years, this stone has been quarried or mined for fashioning into alabaster or manufacturing gypsum plaster. The Normans used alabaster in the west doorway of Tutbury Priory Church, foundations of the castle and decorations inside. John of Gaunt ordered blocks of gypsum from Fald for an alabaster monument in memory of his first wife, which was placed in Old St. Paul's Cathedral. While the mineral was traditionally quarried, by the 19th century gypsum in East Staffordshire was largely acquired via mining. They notes that there were three working gypsum mines in Hanbury Parish in 1894, and the mine of J.C. Statton of Fald was producing 10,000 tons of plaster products a year, including blocks used in the construction of a mansion in New York for Cornelius Vanderbilt. These mines used the pillar and stall method, in which large chambers were excavated, leaving behind pillars, approximately every 20 feet, of the rock to support the roof. This meant that the mining process left large open chambers after the mineral was removed. But even with the gypsum mined out, these chambers would find a use. Keith Falconer, head of industrial archaeology at Corsham Stone Mines, explains, The idea of bomb-proof shelters to protect men in stores is enshrined in much military defense planning since the advent of military explosives. But only with the threat of bombardment from the air did it become necessary to escape the confines of designed fortresses. Falcon explains that the UK Ministry of Munitions started storing munitions in disused mines during the Great War due to the threat of bombardment by zeppelins. But the need was better recognized and greatly expanded between the wars when the RAF Air Ministry estimated that a war reserve would require nearly 100,000 tons of aerial munitions. Several sites were selected, including some of the empty gypsum mines near Fald. In her 2012 book, Voices from the Explosion, local historian and eyewitness Valerie Hardy writes that in 1937, as a precaution against the growing threat of Nazi Germany, the Duchy of Lancaster sold part of one of Peter Ford's gypsum mines to the Air Ministry. Military historian John Reed noted in After the Battle magazine in 1977 that the fold mines were 90 feet below the surface and sufficiently capacious to accommodate up to 10,000 tons of high-explosive bombs, although the facility would be greatly expanded as demands increased, with Hardy noting that the storage was increased to 24,000 tons later in 1937. Hardy writes that the company of Peter Ford and Sons continued mining seams of gypsum in an adjacent mine and operated a plaster works on the surface. Lee writes that the passages were 12 feet high and 20 feet wide and had space for trucks. Inside the atmosphere was clear air at 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Reed notes the precautions were taken in the design of the storage, including a two and a half foot thick concrete roof lining and the erection of a 50 foot barrier between the incendiary storage area from the high explosive storage. But Hardy writes that whereas in the innermost part of the store where the high explosive bombs were stored was an overhead protective cover of 90 feet, the depth of Earth's coverage above the incendiary storage area was only 60 feet, and above the detonator storage area, which was the most sensitive of all, the depth was barely 40 feet. A light railway was also built to connect the facility to a main line about a mile away. The facility was manned by the newly constituted 21 Maintenance Unit, RAF Fault, and by 1940, Hardy writes, had become the RAF's showpiece ammunition store. But despite that fact, Hardy notes that in the interest of wartime security, the existence of the ammunition depot was officially not known to the local people. She writes that while most people were aware that bombs were being stored in the disused mines, no one was in a position to appreciate fully the huge amount of high-explosive bombs and other ammunition stored 
in a labyrinth of caverns. The facility continued to be expanded, and in early 1944 received a detachment of United States Army Air Force personnel, aiding in the handling of large 1,000-pound and 4,000-pound high-explosive bombs for the Army Air Force preparations for D-Day, which Reed describes as the heaviest and most difficult to handle of the many new types of armaments stored underground. And with more labor needed, 194 Italian prisoners of war from nearby Hilton Prisoner of War Camp were also employed at the facility, something allowed after the September 1943 armistice of Kessabilli. Hardy writes that as the relentless demands of Bomber Command intensified in the build-up to the D-Day landings and continuing Allied advance in the months which followed, Munitions Unit No. 21 RAF Fald was working at a full stretch up to 20,000 tons of bombs per month. Hardy also notes that in addition to storing and issuing ammunition, the facility also had the responsibility for inspecting and repairing jettison bombs, a job that was handled by civilian employees of the Armaments Inspectorate Department, or AID. This work was done in an area called Exploder Pocket. However, the expansion of the facility did cause problems, as Reed notes. There were few amongst the new arrivals who had more than a rudimentary knowledge of the hazards involved in handling explosives, and more distressingly, the position of chief equipment officer, supposed to be the senior specialist in handling explosives, had been vacant since September 1944, because, as Reed writes, no suitable officer could be found to fill it. Civilian inspectors were overwhelmed by the size of the workload and the influx of new employees, so that Reed writes, All too often, the chief examiners found themselves condoning practices that would, in times of peace, have merited instant dismissal. A November 2014 edition of the BBC News reports, matter-of-factly, on 27 November 1944, around 4,000 tons of bombs stored at RAF Fald in Staffordshire exploded. Reed writes that the explosion occurred at 11.10 a.m., the first shock felt by the armorer who had just left the team in the new area and had just reached the old mine was little more than a sharp crack. Then came a long, drown-out explosion with a violent blast that hurled all who stood in its path to the ground. In 1956, the London Daily Herald quoted Joseph Clifford Salt, who was in charge of civilian staff in the mine. The first was like an ordinary 500-pounder going off, and I was not too worried. Then came the second explosion, and that was different. Hell, I said to myself, what happened? Valerie Hardy was eight years old at the time, a resident of Fald House Farm she and her sister were at school that day. She told the BBC, we heard this enormous bang. People didn't know what was happening. Classmate Margaret White told the Derbyshire Evening Telegraph in 1999, the teacher was talking to us and all at once the ground sort of heaved up. The next thing we knew, the windows were shattering and falling in. Hardy quotes Doug Archer of Hanbury riding a horse nearby. There was a blinding flash, and it looked like a great mountain in front of you. The stuff stood up so high. Pieces as big as railway engines were going up in the sky. We just stood and watched. Philip Chandler was an RAF crewman working at a bomber training base, RAF Church Broughton, some five miles away. He recalled to the Evening Telegraph, I felt pressure on the ears, rather like that experience sometimes in a train going through a tunnel. He looked toward Tutbury and saw a huge cloud of dust, smoke, and flying debris. William Shelley was working in a field. When the ground I was standing on shook under my feet, and then I heard a great bang and looked across and saw it was like a mountain in the air, and then stones and earth fell all about me. Salt told the Daily Herald, Along the tunnel in front I could see a cloud of dust coming towards me. There was a second, like thunder, rumbling in the distance and rolling nearer. Then the lights went out, and the suction from a gigantic explosion bashed me out of the office. I had aches and pains for a month after it. The explosion was the largest to have ever occurred in the United Kingdom. Hardy writes, The fold explosion, the biggest of the Second World War so far, had occurred at a military site, but its effects were predominantly the destruction of civilian life and property. Lee writes the entire mine was not destroyed, but the hills housing the mine completely disappeared. Virtually every house in Hembury Village was severely damaged. The Cock Inn lost half of its roof, and Upper Hayes Farm completely vanished. In Tutbury, chimney pots and roofs were shattered, and two church steeples in Burton were cracked. One had to be taken down. The blast was heard as far south as Deventry, 19 miles south of Coventry, and at Western Supermare. Seismographs recorded the shockwaves at Casablanca, Joseph Foster, manager of a nearby plaster mine, recalled just one tremendous roar. Going outside, he told the Daily Herald, the whole face of the landscape was different. Castle Hayes Farm had completely disappeared, and when I walked back from the shaft, I found it difficult to get my bearings. Les Caladine was a member of the mine rescue team that responded to the tragedy.
Arriving some six hours after the blast, he recalled, the explosion had taken place approximately half a mile into the pit. It had taken everything in the vicinity up with it, including a farm and two cottages on the surface. Not even a brick could be found that resembled coming from a building. The only things visible were dead horses, cattle, and the odd mattress, all of which were covered in falling debris. The recollection of John Heath, a schoolchild at Burton-upon-Heath, was recorded by the North Hertfordshire Museum. In the area of the explosion, the earth moved. A 300-acre farm, including people, animals, tractors, carts, and buildings, was completely blown away. The entire topsoil from a square mile of land went up and came back to earth up to 11 miles away. One man who survived had been cutting a field of roots at the edge of a wood. He reported that he watched an entire two and a half acres of woodland went up into the air and out of sight. Some trees returned to earth, being hurled so deep into the ground that farmers plowing their land came upon them roots first. One man, when he came to, did not know where he was because not a single landmark remained to remind him of where he grew up. In Burton, chimneys toppled and buildings cracked. But there was another threat, Reed writes. 200 yards from the center of the explosion, there was a 30-foot-high dam, 35 feet wide at its base and 14 feet at the top, which retained an artificial lake, covering an area of half an acre. The water from the lake was used by the Peter Ford plaster and cement works, used when the gypsum being mined was converted into plasterboard. The dam literally distorted in the upheaval that accompanied the explosion, crumbled and released the contents of the reservoir, which swept in a torrent 200 yards towards the gypsum works, Reed writes. Foster told the Daily Herald, we later discovered the fish in it had been blown hundreds of feet away. The flood of mud and debris buried the mill and the men working inside. It swept across the countryside, killing, it is presumed, 37 people. The plaster works were never rebuilt, although the mine still operates today. It's unclear exactly how many died that day. The official report said 90, but a memorial at the National Memorial Arboretum lists 70, including one mine rescue worker who died overcome by toxic fumes in the mine. At the time, the Burton Observer and Chronicle listed among the dead Edmund Wesley, a plaster mine worker and former clever halfback footballer, George Priestley, a mine worker and football enthusiast who had five sons serving overseas, Joseph Cooper, locomotive driver, Arthur Harris, mine foreman, RAF Corporal A. Dunrose, and three unnamed Italian POWs. The government couldn't keep an explosion that size completely secret. It was reported at the time, but the reporting was extremely limited and couldn't even mention RAF fall. It was called the Staffordshire Explosion. There was a court of inquiry into the accident, but the results were not made public until 1974. The court found that the explosion was likely caused by an airman who was using a brass chisel to remove a fuse from a bomb, something that was strictly prohibited because it could cause sparks, which likely caused the resultant explosion. One RAF officer and one civilian were criticized for not doing enough checks, and both were reassigned, and that is the full extent to which the government held anyone responsible for the explosion. The commanding officer of RAF Fald was allowed to sit as a member in the board of inquiry into his own accident after the war was knighted for his services. The men of the Ilkston Mine Rescue Team were commended by the Air Ministry for their efforts in the recovery operation, and local communities raised a memorial fund that made payments to victims and their families. Today there are two memorials to the dead from the RAF Fald explosion, one that was erected in 1990 and one in 2014, as well as, of course, the still visible crater, 100 feet deep and 1,000 feet wide. In 2014, the Derbyshire Evening Telegraph lamented that the Fald explosion is a nearly forgotten and underappreciated disaster outside the immediate area. But, the paper notes, anyone who was there can tell you exactly what they were doing the day the dump exploded. <laughs>
I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.